how I got into multifamily was through passive investing. So I started putting some money through there. But the one thing I would encourage as you're contemplating all this, any of your listeners, if you're hesitant to get in, the adage in real estate is there's no better time to invest than yesterday. And I think action is the most critical element. And if you accept the fact that there are going to be challenges, there is no smooth sailing, although the last few years seems to have been more smooth sailing than many prior years, I do think it's really important to take action. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the journey to multifamily millions. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Zana Investments, Tim Little. And on today's show, we have with us Marcus Arredondo. Marcus Arredondo is an experienced investor, entrepreneur, multifamily syndicator, and corporate tenant representative. As the founder and managing partner of Edge West Capital, a private real estate investment firm, he has acquired and managed over 2,000 doors, spanning a total of six states, including Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, and Texas. Marcus, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it is great to have you here. You have a ton of experience, so I'm really looking forward to getting into this. So I gave everyone a high-level overview of your background, but on this show, we really like to get into the details of how you got started on your journey. So please take us back to the beginning and tell us how you got to where you are today. Sure. So after graduating college, I got a degree in philosophy. And of course, my parents were wondering what I was going to do with that. But I think something, I thought about law. I thought about a variety of things. I had an acumen for finance, or at least math, I should say. And trying to figure out where I'm going to go with that, I determined that law wasn't where I wanted to go. If I were speaking to my younger self, getting a legal degree doesn't necessarily mean you have to go into law. There's a variety of things that you could do, but I... Has a limited perspective on on what could I could do with that. And a friend of mine who had interned as a researcher at a real estate firm had spoken to me about his experience and what it was like. And from my experience, I probably knew two or three people who had been in real estate through my parents. And they seemed to have just a special life. And what I mean by that is it was outside the norm of what I had grown accustomed to, all of those traditional jobs. So the idea that somebody was working for themselves as an investor, I see behind you, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So if we're going to go into the cash flow quadrant, it was an investor versus a business owner. My maximum experience was business owner or self-employed. Seeing how they ran their life and the freedom they had was super appealing to me, but also the gamesmanship, I think that took place there. I was an athlete growing up. I still remain relatively competitive. I've tried to find peace in the competition because it can drive you mad sometimes, but it's really been beneficial to understand that sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and you got to keep moving forward. So all that to say, I one of my first jobs was actually at a syndication firm. I was 23 or 24 years old. It was a boutique firm specialized in international investors. I was a Japanese company. It was a really beneficial experience, but I primarily was functioning in a brokerage capacity. So I got my chops in just transactional strategy and what takes place in that process. And I transitioned out of that into tenant rep. And I've been, I still practice tenant rep now, and I'm coming up close to 20 years now. And I didn't think I'd be doing it this long, but I do enjoy several elements of that process. I do like the negotiation, but one of the, and the sophistication that's required. So the primary contacts and clients of mine and ours are C-suite executives, general counsels, <clears throat> heads of HR, so these people have a wealth experience financially, and they're having to reconcile investor drive with their own operational drive and underscore it with financial levers that are going to be advantageous for their overall bottom line and enable them to grow and maintain employment. So to retain and recruit new employees was really critical. So understanding the different facets of these entities were was really compelling and Seeing their finances, going behind the scenes, I think there's a natural tendency to assume that it's a relatively binary transaction. It's straightforward and it really isn't. These are not like the leases that we're dealing with, with singular tenants. These leases are 124 pages long. There's seven rounds of back and forth between 
attorneys on the landlord side and the tenant side. So I really enjoyed that strategy. I, under, I really enjoyed the leverage game, trying to understand which levers we can pull with respect to one landlord versus another to extract the most value that we could. Uh, but I think the thing that I found most interesting was the DNA of a lot of these companies and understanding what drove them. Primary, uh, previous to starting a transaction, we have a brainstorming session where we do strategic planning and we hear from stakeholders, we hear from employees, we hear from a number of staff members and hear what drives them. Why are they coming into the office? What are the clients attracted to? Is it the geography? Is it the drive time? Is it access to public transportation? And then fundamentally, what's driving their profits and revenue and how that influences their occupancy of space? So is it culturally driven? Do people need to be in the office? And certainly now understanding how work from home and being in the office is reconciled on a moving target. Um, and I think that's really what drove my compulsion toward business and acquiring businesses and understanding where there might be value. And so uh, in parallel, in the early period of being in my brokerage business, it was 2000, I joined in 2006, seven, eight started to happen. And that was right when I was starting to really try and get my business to grow. And I witnessed a number of senior colleagues of mine who are in their 50s, who are in their 60s, have challenges as a result of what was taking place in the world. The 2008 downturn was impactful to virtually everybody. So it wasn't just their 401ks that were taking hits, it was their business. When the downturn happens, immediately tenants and occupants want to reduce space. They take, uh, they commit to shorter terms. They want more flexibility. They're more inclined to do short-term subleases versus long-term direct deals. So all of that had a really pivotal impact on the way I looked at the world. And looking forward 15, 20 years from now, back then, I thought, I want to be as protected as I can be. And that was underscored by the fact that as a broker, you only eat what you kill. So we, I, I, for 20 years, I've never had a salary. I've only been a hunter. And so that really drills into your psyche and your emotional state and how you approach problems with a different tenacity. I do think that there's a different makeup of somebody that's having to go chase and figure out business and it's either do or die. There's no soft landing there. That feast and famine experience was monumental to me. And I started looking for alternatives and I dabbled in stocks here and there, but I soon found out, especially since several of my friends are in finance and on Wall Street, as a little fish in there, I really had no advantage. I was simply going off of what was publicly released, gut feeling, and that really wasn't the right way to go about it. So I was looking for a number of different at, uh, facets to pursue. So I ended up starting to acquire single family homes. I thought that at least at the very least, I in getting into that, well, let me just pause for a second. Through a relationship, I had a little bit of an in on getting some of these deals in Michigan through tax auction. Right then and there, I knew it was below replacement cost. They could be backfilled with tenants. The thing that I underestimated, which I'll get into, was on the capital expenditure and the improvement rehabilitation plan for these units. But at the very least, I thought if I lost my hide in doing this, I would walk out of this experience with, at worst case scenario, a, a, a equivalent of a form of an MBA. I would walk out of here with a business experience that I'd never forget and would certainly be beneficial to me in the future. But on the best case scenario, I walk out with that plus potentially my money or even better than that, some profit. And so I started buying more and more and I had a small portfolio, which was an extraordinary experience. I had to switch property managers. I had to go from market rate tenants to section eight tenants. I've had to replace boilers and some pumps and through inspections, I had to replace sidewalks. I've, I've encountered what should have been a hundred dollar utility bill become a $900 utility bill only to find out that this tenant and their family were having pool parties in this blow up pool. And of course we were swallowing the utility for the water bill. So it was no sweat to them. So all of these experience started to add up and be incredibly beneficial. There's rocky roads there. I didn't use any debt and I thought I would sleep at night because I wouldn't be worried about the debt. So I bought it all cash and then rehabs would come in and you'd find out it was 50% more than what you had allocated and what contractors gave you. 
And that was a balancing act. So that's where sort of an entrepreneurial spirit really came in to help me because I needed cash. I had cash to, to pay for it, but I also wanted to preserve it. And so I worked with a consulting firm to get credit. I got hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit via credit cards at 0% interest. What I didn't realize is that you can't pay contractors with credit cards. So I ended up having to solve that problem by buying gold on an online market and immediately liquidating it. And there's, per, there's percentage fees, but I'm paying it's 3% money, right? So it's not 16% money. So I managed to beg, borrow and steal through that. And that took six to nine months, paid it all back and managed all those credit cards and got out of it. But that's how I survived and started the cash flow. And it was six to nine months before the dust settled and we started to rock and roll. But that was a big challenging experience. But when I was doing that, the thing that I started to learn and that I have family, I have friends that, that buy single family homes. And for the record, I had a property manager. I had a contractor. I wasn't going out there every week, but I was going out there every month or two to check in. People don't realize there's an opportunity cost there because you, it is very much, despite the fact that it's an investment, you are also effectively a business owner and an employee of that investor, that being yourself. And there's a considerable amount of time that you have to put into managing this, understanding it, going through bids, for example, they're apples and oranges, I'd say 90% of the time. And if you're not reading through the details and having conversations, you're likely to miss something. And those, those raindrops make puddles. And over, over time, that can be really problematic. You, I learned on the fly. I had a significant amount of experience in real estate in general, transactional. I had some capital expenditure experience, but nothing was like being in the trenches where it's your money and you're responsible for it. And so that experience really led me to two conclusions. One, if I'm going to be doing this, I think I would want others to benefit from it. I kept thinking about my father, who's a dentist, who did well, and but he comes from humble beginnings and started as a firefighter. And he had never been able to find a way to get into bigger deals as an investor where he didn't have to take on the obligation of running the show. And with that experience, I started looking at smaller multifamily assets, maybe between 15 and 50 units, thinking that I could take it down with myself and two or three other people or something like that. And that through that process, I realized that there is a lot of benefit in scale. And what I specifically mean by that is property management fees go down proportionate to the overall income. So instead of paying 10%, you're paying 6%, 3%. You have more buying power. So your contractors are willing to get a little bit more aggressive in the cost per widget per se. You're also enabling the ability to get greater talent. You'll have more professional property managers. You'll have accountants that will be paying attention to. And so with those two things being that I wanted to open this up to other people, and that the buying power actually increases with scale, I started looking at larger deals and realized that I needed to get a partner that had more experience than me. And I found a partner that has been terrific and has given a lot of guidance for the years. But I think that's really critical is finding in every element of life, I think there's a benefit to being an apprentice and being a service provider to some degree in I always remind myself that now as we manage, the number one priority is serving my investors. As much as I personally want to do well and excel and create value for my family, I won't be able to do it without the benefit of what it, having investors get returns and for them to trust me and to work on that trust because that trust is given and it continues to be earned every at every step of the way in good times and bads. I think that summarizes where how I got to where I am, but still a lot of lessons to be learned. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much to unpack there based on just your vast and variety of experience. First, I want to go back to job. And you talked about being a tenant rep. Was that exclusively in the office space? That's a really good question. So we represent, let's think of about it as a, in a, in a courtroom, there's the plaintiff and the defense or in a home sale. There's a representative for the buyer and the seller. In this case, it was for the tenant. There's representatives for the tenant and there's representatives for the landlord. And oftentimes brokers will do both. The firm I joined was exclusive to tenants and that was primarily office. But as we saw increased consolidation and globalization, what I mean by that is companies started to acquire, uh, certainly following 2008, a lot of smaller companies started to get absorbed. They started to have outreach into other continents because of labor disparities and logistics and so on and so forth. To answer your question, it was fundamentally office users, but it did branch into retail and industrial primarily. 
Yeah, and I can't even imagine the uncomfortable meetings and soul searching that's happening within the office space right now, especially post COVID, where people weren't sure if everyone was just going to flood back to the office. And then, of course, you have articles coming out saying office is dead, it's never coming back. Do I believe that? Not necessarily, because that's just a headline and they have to use inflammatory headlines in order to get read. And I'm sure the truth is somewhere in between. There will be that continue, who continues to go to the office. And there will also be that much larger than was before contingent that is working from home. Is that your general assessment as well? No question. If I can peel that onion a little bit more. Sure. I think we're at an interesting time because there's a confluence of events that are occurring that aren't just pandemic oriented. Prior to the pandemic, we had Zoom. Zoom was around, right? Everybody had it. We were veering more toward laptops versus desktops by that point. And virtually everybody had a cell phone with data access. And, mm -hmm. and the pandemic happened. It, in my opinion, I think expedited the next five to 10 years into a two-year span. And there's several things that I think ended up happening during that time frame. One, companies realized in some instances, not across the board, that productivity didn't go down. Or if it did go down, it went down a very small margin by comparison to what their reduction in operating expenses would be just by virtue of their occupancy costs if they were to offload some or all of their office space. And when these publicly traded companies are valued on a multiple of their EBITDA and their biggest, their second to third biggest line item, typically the largest expenses, it used to be HR, payroll, and then right. real estate. Now it's technology, payroll, real estate, in one of those three orders. And when you remove one of the three largest line items, that has a huge boost to your NOI, right? So that, that's something that's a can't that's out of the bag that can't get put back in. But secondarily, what we're seeing, and obviously inflationary pressures have exacerbated or at least amplified the effects of this, but our labor market is in an interesting place because I think the pandemic caused several more seasoned employees who are approaching retirement to accept the prospect of retiring and doing so. Simultaneously, there's been a growth of businesses during that time frame, which require employees. And then thirdly, the employment pool has dwindled just by virtue of our population growth. And that younger population is also a part of those who are seeking new businesses. And so there's a reconciliation happening right now that we see on a daily basis where companies want to bring their employees back for culture. And there are companies that require culture. It's important and it drives their revenue. But there's no question that there are other companies that don't benefit so much from an in-person culture. So that creates a very interesting dynamic where at one point it was incumbent on the entity to provide a location that everybody can go to and naturally assume that everybody's going to go there. But now the pendulum has shifted where there are, there are plenty of jobs and there aren't as many employees. And I think there's a leverage situation that is creating challenges for, especially for those companies that culturally believe that they need to be back in the office. So I'll summarize it back to your point though. I appreciate you letting me go on, go on that tangent, but I think it, there is somewhere in the middle. I think there will always be a need for office. I think the way we use office space is going to be different. I just saw a survey regarding AMLA 100 firms where some of the largest firms are starting to put partners in hotel desks now instead of offices. And officers are going to be granted to people not by seniority, but how often they come into the office. And I've got a, an eight-month-old son. Luckily, I have an office that's detached from the house where I tend to work, but I can understand where with family and kids in summer, you're probably not wanting to be at home and you do get incentivized to go to the office. And I think it does build a strong community, but it's certainly, interestingly enough to tie back to what we are pursuing, I think it is changing the way people occupy their own home. So I do think people are spending more time at home and it is changing what the amenity package is starting to look like. I think in the long term for multifamily. 
Yeah, and that's a really good point to to bring it right back around. I asked about the office space just because while I'm focused on multifamily, I think it's interesting to take a look at some of these other commercial real estate assets. But that was perfect how you brought it right back around because like you said, the amenity packages, whether that's high-speed internet or people even moving up in the sizes of the units that they're looking for, moving from a two-bedroom to a three-bedroom because they want a bedroom that's exclusively an office for example, that's not something that I think a lot of people would have predicted beforehand, but it, and it's the same is true with housing, right? They're wanting larger houses, maybe outside of the cities and even suburbs where they can be out in the country. But as long as they have a good internet connection, they have a big old house, then they have more space, especially when people were quarantined and they're, and they're stuck in a small place working. They're like, if I'm going to do this anyways, then why not be comfortable and have that larger space? Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I also think that you're going to start seeing potentially some business center type usage that becomes available to tenants. Certainly, I think we're seeing that in, in class A apartments where, you know, there, there's a gym that's available there. But then I, I think there's a business center that's going to start. I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some form of co-working environment in some of those locations. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I just wanted to hit on like one of the other things that you were talking about when you were talking about financial crisis period and how important it is to shift perspective. It can be all doom and gloom, but the people who ride out that pain can really come through that period with a whole bunch of lessons and be more resilient on the other side. And I think that's relevant even today as there are big changes happening within multifamily now. And I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I see this as a transitionary period for multifamily where, you know, you went from, say, one type of loan to another type of loan and what you had before doesn't necessarily work now. And I'll just use the example of bridge loans. There was a time when everyone was using bridge loans because that's what made sense based on the numbers, based on lending rates, et cetera. And of course, you got armchair quarterbacks now who are like, oh, I can't believe they use bridge loans. That's because that's how the numbers worked. And now they don't work so well once those rates go to levels that no one could have imagined when they things were stuck at so low for so long. I could not agree more. And I don't think people, I'll just, I'll put a little embarrassment on my parents here for a second, but I'm 41 years old. My parents were talking to me about, you know, how certain elements to having a baby and telling me how to do certain things. And I wanted to tell them the last time you did that was 41 years ago. So I think there's been a lot that's changed since then. And I think that applies to almost every aspect of life. And so to go back to 2008, moving forward, as I was looking at different asset classes to invest in, historically, multifamily has fared as well as any other asset class, meaning it it is not second to any other asset class. It has been proven to be among the most resilient. Now, is that, I'm obviously a huge proponent of multifamily assets. I think in the long run, they will always end up performing and gaining value. But to your point, how people bought in 2010 is very different than how people were buying in 2020. And what ends up happening is you ask about office and you like keeping tabs of other real estate asset classes, but the reality is they're all tethered together. There's a lot of the people playing in one pool or playing in other pools, especially on the institutional level. And those institutions, believe it or not, are back channeling into different in private equity, into debt, and then those debt funds are managing it differently. And so... When these ebbs and flows start to happen, different products become available. And to your point about bridge, I think it is unfortunate. And I think, I think it's a challenge when people want to prove other people wrong in hindsight, because it's very easy to be part of the peanut gallery and say that wasn't a wise decision, but there was no other way to acquire assets at that time in order to make them work. It was among the most competitive buying environments we've ever been in. And I'm not a proponent of sitting things out. I'm also not a proponent of overpaying. But if you're paying in proportion to the information that you have at the time, I still think that there's good deals out there. And that is proving out to be the case. And just like in any other environment, there are deals that don't pencil and they end up going in the wrong direction. And guess what? 
I, this is an unfortunate part of it being an investor, but just like I said, at the beginning of the call in a comp competitive world, you're going to win some and you're going to lose some, but over the long run, you want to win more than you lose. And I don't enjoy losing. I don't accept that as a prospect, but inevitably that's going to happen. And as much of a fan as I am about multifamily, I remain diversified. I look at other asset classes. I like, I like alternative asset classes. And as my network has grown, my access to information and deals has grown. And so it's enabled me to get access to a whole slew of different industries and different geographies with all different pressures that are different than multifamily. But for example, no one's, no one is impervious to a global wide pandemic and no one could have foreseen, foreseen that was going to happen. And that pandemic causing logistical issues that caused material costs to go through the roof. Nobody could have foreseen that, right? At least at the rate it was. We couldn't have foreseen that natural disasters would cause insurance premiums in Florida to go up, not by percentage points, but by multiples. That was unforeseen. What was also unforeseen is seeing the Fed increase interest rates 500 basis points in 13 months. That had never happened in U.S. history. Now, there's cases where that's happened elsewhere, but you add all those elements up, among other things, including what, what happened with oil, what happened with the war in Russia, in Ukraine, all of these things becomes several 50, 100,000 year floods occurring at once. <laughs> and we're all in this together and we got to figure out a solution. And no one is immune from having challenges being presented to them. Yeah, exactly. You have a whole bunch of black swans flying in as a flock at one time. But I think to what we were talking about earlier, when you go through those, sure, there's going to be some sponsors who don't make it and or just say, you know what, this isn't for me after that deal that went a little rough and they're going to fall to the wayside for sure. But I think the, those of us who, who stick it out and keep those deals alive in the face of adversity are going to be much more resilient on the other side. I could not agree more. Just to go back to 2008, obviously that was a pretty pivotal point in my life to witness, but the, my colleagues during that time frame who came out of it and remain as resilient, remain as persistent as they were prior to 2008, coming out of 2008, they not only gained so much experiential value, they started to gain market share. So when they started to come out of that, they actually came out far ahead of many of their peers because they stuck it out, they doubled down and they continue to move forward. And I think to your point, that's the same thing here. I think all of us who are on the trenches right now have experienced over the last 24 months, but even more specifically the last 12 are walking out of here with years of experience worth that I think many people from 2014 to 2022 had never experienced before. Or if they had, they'd experienced some aspects, but not all of them at once, or so many of them at once, I guess is a better way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. And you talked about your single family experience and I identified with that. I decided I wasn't going to do single family necessarily, just because I had read a couple of books and I was trying to mitigate risk, but I was limited on funds. And so I was like, okay, let me do at least small multifamily because to your point of scale, my thought process was, all right, one single family property that is unrented is 100% vacant. Totally. <laughs> but if I have a duplex that's half vacant, that's 50% occupied, right? Sure. And that may be enough to offset my costs for the mortgage. I may not be making cash flow at that level, but still. And so went really to that whole risk mitigation piece. And then I discovered passive investing, tried that out. And I was like, oh, this is a real thing. And that was my segue into a multifamily syndication for all of the reasons that you talked about, which is the benefits of scale for so many things, whether it's the property management, whether it's the cost for renovations, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to ask you in terms of the survey, you said that serving investors is the top priority. And I think that's a really important thing to, to emphasize because there's a transition period where maybe you have your own properties 
And you risked significant sums of money, it sounds like, in doing that. And you did it in cash, which you saw that as reducing your risk because you weren't taking a loan. That, that it sounds like you were able to do because you were on that higher income scale. So what I'll highlight about that is I think for people who are listening, hey, there's different ways to get started, right? Even if you don't have 100% to put down on that property, maybe you have enough to put down on that down payment in order to get it and get a mortgage. And maybe you do have enough to put down in cash. But the point is that you took action because otherwise so many people just get paralyzed and no, I'm not sure how to do it. I don't know what to do. But then we can come to them and say, hey, learn from my mistakes. Had we to do it over again, maybe we just would have passively invested that money or looked at going into multifamily syndication as a general partner, whatever the case may be. But I think there's that transition that happens from putting in your own money to realizing, okay, this is not just about me anymore. I'm investing someone else's money. And this may be their first deal. This is a lot of money to them. And they may be very cautious about doing this in the first place. So talk about that, that responsibility that comes with investing other people's money for the first time. So you brought up a lot of really good points. And I just want to touch back on, on something you said about the way I purchased. I didn't necessarily think it was less risk. I just thought I would sleep more out of con- less concern. That was not the case. And I would agree with you. I actually think there is more risk by doing it that way. And going back, my motivations at the time were different than my motivations are now. And how I got into multifamily was through passive investing. So I started putting some money through there. But the one thing I would encourage as you're contemplating all this, any of your listeners, if you're hesitant to get my motivations at the time were different than my motivations are now. And how I got into multifamily was through passive investing. So I started putting some money through there. But the one thing I would encourage as you're contemplating all this, any of your listeners, if you're hesitant to get in, the adage in real estate is there's no better time to invest than yesterday. And I think action is the most critical element. And if you accept the fact that there are going to be challenges, there, there's no smooth sailing, although the last few years seems to have been more smooth sailing than many prior years, I do think it's really important to, to take action in the adage in real estate is there's no better time to invest than yesterday. And I think action is the most critical element. And if you accept the fact that there are going to be challenges, there, there's no smooth sailing, although the last few years seems to have been more smooth sailing than many prior years, I do think it's really important to, to take action. And to answer your question about what it's like to be serving investors, Look, these investors, I know every single one of them. I've got a relationship with them. Some I'm closer to than others. Some are family. Others are friends. Other friends are friends. And others are people I've met. And each one of their dollars is, I take a perspective on that it's more valuable than my own dollar, despite the fact that my own dollar is invested aside alongside them. I've never done a deal that I'm not invested in myself, materially proportionate to what I can invest. And none of that's taken lightly. I think, unfortunately, I think there are some operators out there that are in it for themselves. And look, we all are in it for ourselves. I think the important part is about aligning the motivations, incentivizing ourselves to perform so that we benefit only if and when our investors benefit. And we've had challenges. We're still having challenges here and there. And Talking to investors about it is the one thing I know I can sleep at night about is I am being as judicious, authentic. I am being the greatest steward I can possibly be in those circumstances and being straight with people and telling them exactly as it is, I hope is beneficial. It's certainly beneficial to me. I've continued to invest with people who've shot me straight, even when the going is tough. And I accept that responsibility, but at the end of the day, it is an investment and we're going to do everything we can to make sure it succeeds. Yeah. And I think the two points that you highlighted right there with what you were saying were alignment of interest 
making sure that everyone is aligned to include you and your money. Now, I don't think that passive investors should expect you to be investing an equal amount to what they're investing because most of the time that is just not sustainable for you to do multiple deals if you're investing 100000 of your own dollars every time you do a deal. I'll just say that that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize is that yeah. if passives want access to deals, the operator needs to maintain liquidity in order to qualify them for the loans. There's a, an, a tremendous amount of money that's taken up when tying up deals They is at risk. I've seen others lose that money. Fortunately, we've never lost any earnest money, but in some cases, at the very least, it's several hundreds of thousands of dollars and others, it's millions. And so that, that there is a burden there that we are obviously willingly participating in, but it does disable us from, I'm certainly not as wealthy as I'd like to be, and I would like to be more financially stable, but all I know is that I'm going to do everything I can to align myself with our investors. So I think that's a really important point that you brought up. Yeah. And I think it's something that, that we as sponsors probably need to do more education on to potential investors or current investors so that they understand the cost that we're incurring associated with just getting the deal done, getting it off the ground and in the time, right? There, there's a cost associated with time, like you talked about earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Honestly, as operators, th our payday comes when the profits come. That's when it happens, is when it sells and when it sells at a large profit. That's really the only reason operators are in it for. Sure, there's, there are fees along the way, but that's not by itself a sustainable way to make a living. But I think it's also within that, in that investor's alignment of interest though, right? If because if we're looking at year three, year five, whenever that asset is selling, that means we're committed for the long haul because that's when we're going to actually see the payday for us, despite the distributions that they'll most likely be getting on a monthly, quarterly basis. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other piece that I wanted to hit very quickly was just transparency and, and how vital that is for any passive investor. And that's something that I think that they should put at the top of their checklist when vetting any sponsor is their commitment to transparency, even those uncomfortable conversations, which have been happening a little more lately than they had been <laughs> the previous couple of years. But this, is, this has been some awesome insights, but I do need to move on to the turbo round. I'm ready. All right, so I'm gonna ask you three questions that I asked every guest that I saw on the show, and I just asked you for a quick, honest answer. All right, first question is, what is one red flag every investor should look out for? Spin. I think that goes back to what you said about transparency and what I believe it, you know comes from authenticity. If somebody doesn't know something, they better say it because making up an answer is the wrong thing to do in my opinion. And at the end of the day, you have to know and trust these people, but trusting I think goes beyond anything else. Yep, couldn't agree more. All right, the second question, what is a myth about this business that you would like to set straight? That it's riskless. <laughs> there's, there's challenges, it's an operating business. Projections change because our environments change. And so we, I think fundamentally as a global community need to adapt to those changes and multifamily is no different. Yep, as we've seen, change is the only constant. All right. Finally, what does success look like to you? This is a great question. I think it's maximizing the value I can provide each day. And what I mean by that is having a son recently has changed my perspective relative to being present. I've always thought about the future. I've lived most of my life really thinking about the future, pushing toward that next step. And I think there's a tremendous amount of value in continuing to think about your future. But by being present, I've realized I, I need to be there. I want to experience these moments with my family and it's a unique experience, but how do I reconcile that with the, all that I want to achieve? And the way I do that is by squeezing every ounce of life and opportunity to improve myself to my community. And it starts with my family. And I think if I can be a better if I can serve my family better and my community better tomorrow or today than I did yesterday, I'm on the right path. Yeah, it's amazing how much 
those priorities can be altered once you have kids. I have a four and a seven year old. And like you talked about that, that living in the present, you, you just, you have to consciously think about it sometimes. My daughter asked me this morning, my seven year old, if I could walk her to camp and it's like half a mile. It's not far at all. I was just going to drive and she's like, please daddy. And it's okay. You know what? I'm going to take a walk with my daughter. Is it going to hurt if I take those 20, 25 minutes out? Not at all. And I might regret not doing it in the future. So, You bring up a, an interesting point. One of the ways I determine, I help to make decisions is will I regret the following decision in five years, 10 years, or 15 years, which one will I regret more? And I think in, invariably a walk with your daughter is going to be more cherished than whatever else you were going to do. Yeah, no, that's some great perspective. Hey, Marcus, this has been an awesome conversation. Please tell our guests how they can get a hold of you. And if you have anything else that you'd like to share with them. It, best place is edgewestcap.com. If you go to edgewestcap.com forward slash ebook, there's a nice little introductory book that tells you a little bit more about ourselves and the way we approach business. All right, Marcus, thanks again. We'll definitely have all that information in the show notes. I appreciate you coming on and look forward to seeing you do big things on your journey to multifamily millions. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. 